Good afternoon and welcome to the Sustainable Cleveland 2021 Virtual Summit. We would like to thank our host for the summit, the Cleveland Public Library. My name is Kathy Lenn, Sustainable Cleveland Manager, and you have joined the Circular Economy and Food Waste in Northeast Ohio breakout session. A circular economy can be defined as the reduction of waste and pollution, the reuse and repair of products to keep them in use longer, and the restoration and renewal of nature. This session will discuss how Kent State University is diverting their food waste from the landfill. Please use the chat box for questions or comments and for resources to be shared during the session. Our moderator for this session is Heather Doherty, Business Development Lead for Insincorator Grind to Energy. Heather? Uh, thank you, Kathy. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, I've really been looking forward to participating um, with the Sustainable Cleveland Summit this year. So um, joining me today is Melanie Knowles. Um, as Kathy mentioned, Melanie is the Manager of Sustainability with Kent State University. And uh, Mark Sukhan is also joining us. And Mark is the Director for Materials Management with Quasar Energy Group, headquartered here in Cleveland. And the three of us recently had an opportunity to um, produce an on-demand presentation showcase showcasing our collaborative efforts to create a circular food economy here in Northeast Ohio. And we uh, recorded this session for the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education. Um, so we'll be sharing this on-demand uh, video with you shortly. Uh, I would like to provide a little bit of insight. And um, so the Association for the Advancement of uh, Sustainability in Higher Education, also known as ASHI, um, was established in 2005, and it was the first higher education um, uh, organization um, focused on sustainability in North America. And today, ASHI is a, an international network of um, academic uh, institutions, as well as their um, supplier stakeholders um, as well. So Insincorator is a proud member of the ASHI community and Kent State University is also a participating um, university within this community. So um, before we begin, I just would like to provide a little bit more insight on um, our three companies. Um, uh, Kent State University has uh, achieved a significant number of awards and ratings in environmental and sustainable initiatives around building, design, um, and zero waste initiatives. Most recently, um, the Campus Race to Zero Waste uh, initiative, Kent State achieved three awards um, focused in uh, on zero waste electronics and uh, case study presentations. So congratulations to Kent State. Um, I know Melanie covers a little bit more about their achievements in our presentation as well. And um, Quasar Energy Group, again, um, headquartered here in Cleveland, was established in 2006. Today, they are doing business across 10 states. And um, I, I'm happy to report, um, I recently learned that, Ken, or that Quasar is sourcing 100% of their components and parts with US uh, organizations and institutions. Um, and then lastly, um, in Syncorator, as Kathy mentioned, I represent the Grind of Energy System. We are doing business across more than a dozen states, and we, um, a decade ago, launched here in Cleveland. So um, really good to be presenting to the Cleveland um, community today. So Brittany, um, if you could please uh, begin our presentation. Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining our on-demand webinar, Supporting a Circular Food Economy, Converting Inedible Food Scraps into Renewable Energy and Beneficial Fertilizer. My name is Heather Doherty, and I'm the Business Development Lead for 
Grind to Energy Food Scrap Recycling System by Incinerator. Joining me today is Melanie Knowles, Manager of Sustainability at Kent State University, and Mark Sukan, who's the Director of Material Management with Quasar Energy Group, a renewable energy company headquartered here in Cleveland. And we're gonna take you on a virtual journey today to showcase how we've created a circular food economy here in Northeast Ohio. And this is a collaborative effort with Incinerator, Kent State University, Quasar, and several other regional stakeholders, including local farms. So to begin, um, I'd really just like to set the stage and provide a high level overview of what a circular economy means for our food systems. And the Ellen MacArthur Foundation defines a circular economy um, that is really based on three principles that are driven by design. And it is to eliminate waste and pollution, circulate products and materials at their highest value, and to regenerate nature. So in order um, to achieve a circular food economy, it's critical for us to, um, it's critical our food never creates waste. And to achieve this, there's two focus areas, um, regenerative food production and waste elimination. So really to sum things up, uh, in a circular food economy, food waste is prevented. We're getting surplus edible food to people in need. And then our inedible food production scraps and human waste are being uh, used as feedstocks for new products. And that's really where our story fits in. So we're capturing um, the inedible food scraps, uh, getting this material to a local anaerobic digester where it's being processed into renewable energy that is going back to our local communities in many forms. And I'd like to share some insight about Ohio's agricultural footprint. Um, that's really a big part of this closed loop solution. Um, we have 75,000 farms across 14 million acres of land. Um, we're cultivating 200 diverse crops and livestock farms. So as you can see, agriculture and food production is our number one industry, making this a significant economic driver across our state. So I'm gonna turn this over to Melanie to start the story. Thanks, Heather. Um, as I tell this story, two themes uh, arise, and those are purpose and collaboration. Kent State's tagline, as you see here, is on with purpose, and we encourage students to find their purpose. But to achieve those ends, uh, we have to collaborate. And any success we have has many partners. And this is a story about how we have collaborated on addressing food waste. So just to set the stage for you, Kent is a small city in Northeast Ohio. Kent State has eight campuses uh, in the region with Kent, the Kent campus being the largest. So we have about 37,000 students total, um, 26,800 of those are at the Kent campus. It's about 950 acres, 127 buildings, and it has 18 different dining locations. And when it comes to sustainability at Kent State, our mission is to grow a sustainable, equitable, and inclusive future for all by implementing transformational sustainability practices into the university's facilities, planning processes, operations, natural environment, and culture. And we have many partners on and off campus that help us to advance sustainability. So some of the examples of successes here, we've worked with the Office of the University Architect on um, achieving LEED building certification. We have 14 LEED certified buildings. Um, we work with our engineers, our power plant, our facilities to uh, save energy. Uh, we have reduced energy consumption at the Kent campus by 24%. And uh, in renewable energy, we have a half a megawatt solar array at our field house. And we just installed three and a half megawatts of solar this last year at our regional campuses. At the Kent campus, we also have a combined heat and power plant that is twice as efficient as a conventional utility power plant. Um, we've worked with partners like the Rec Center and um, Public Safety to implement a bicycle-friendly university, um, uh, get a bicycle-friendly university certification. And with our grounds and our uh, tree advisory board 
on uh, achieving the Tree Campus USA certification. But another really important area of sustainability is waste and recycling. Um, we're always looking for more data so that we can be successful in addressing um, the reduction of these waste streams. So right now we have about a 36% diversion rate. Um, each year uh, we work with a, a class to do some mini waste audits to tell us what is in that waste stream. So we know that up to half of our waste is actually recyclable um, with the most common recyclables still ending up in the trash being paper and plastic bottles. Um, so we have a lot of communication to do on uh, overcoming that. We have sensors on some of our front end load dumpsters that tell us a lot more about the volume of trash and recycling that we have on campus. That also helps us to right size our containers and our pickup schedules so that we're not wasting resources there. But it's been a challenge to get a good idea of how much of our waste is food waste because the dining facilities, the large ones, have compactors and we don't audit those like we do our front end load dumpsters. Um, so we do get some data from dining services, but um, it's posed a challenge. And uh, it also was a challenge with the question of composting to know actually what volume of food waste would be coming out of these facilities. Um, and the question of composting is one of the most common ones we get. But what I try to do is to step back and look at the question of food recovery more broadly than only looking at composting. So I like to share this diagram. It's from the US EPA, the food recovery hierarchy. So the biggest um, priority is at the top, which is source reduction. So how can we be as efficient as possible in producing meals on campus so that we're creating as little food waste as possible. And that's something that our culinary services is always um, striving to improve. And then the next item down is to feed hungry people. And um, the Kent State has a campus kitchen project. It's entirely student driven. And in the last academic year, the 2021 academic year, the campus kitchen recovered over 34 tons of food from on and off campus and distribute it through on-campus pantries, drive through distributions, and by serving hot meals. They reached thousands of individuals and households over this last year. And also over the last year during COVID, the pantry use actually tripled. So it was really important for our community um, that the students at Kent State play this role. Below the feeding hungry people, we have feeding animals and the campus kitchen does divert inedible food scraps um, for um, uh, animal feed. And but below that, we have industrial uses and that's actually where the grind energy system is going to come into play and you're going to hear a lot more about it. So another important part of setting the stage here is the design innovation hub. So the DI hub is a relatively new building. It only opened last academic year on campus. It was a major renovation of an existing building and it is dedicated to interdisciplinary collaboration and to ideas, innovation and creation. So it is filled with labs, maker spaces, even a teaching kitchen. But also important to us is that it's home to a brand new dining facility. So that gave us a great opportunity to design in the grind energy system up front um, so that it would fit in seamlessly with the way that the kitchen functions. And also the idea of capturing food waste for this purpose, uh, we thought was really innovative um, and it fit with the philosophy of the DI hub. So what I really wanna show you is what this looks like on the ground. <laughs> I've got some videos to show you what happens to the food waste that's created in the preparation of meals and the leftovers that are on plates. Uh, remember we chose Grind to Energy with the idea of keeping food out of the landfill and fit our needs for food waste from dining facilities. But the exciting part of this story is really the way that our food becomes part of our circular economy um, and so again, here are some videos to show you what that looks like in practice. So um, here you see the DI hub getting ready for the lunch crowd. And, and in each prep area, there's a green bin to collect food scraps and each staff person saves, 
food scraps for the end of their shift. Here is executive chef Edward Hardin, and he's demonstrating for us and collecting food scraps in the green bin. But leftover food is also collected from the plates. It's built into the system and invisible to diners, like Michael, our student here, who simply has to return the plates on the conveyor. And then you'll see the other side of that in the dish room. The food waste is again, just scraped into the green bin as it comes in on the conveyor. So we do want people to know about the system, even though it's sort of invisible to diners. So we do, we have this display panel right by the dish return that explains the whole grind to energy system to make diners aware of it. And so what happens next? When a bin is full or at the end of a shift, they're taken to the grind to energy system for processing. But I want you to just watch what happens from this point forward, because even for us, after the system was implemented, we learned more and more about the way that it gives back to our circular economy. Okay, great. Melanie, thank you. Um, so yes, so this is where Grind Energy fits in. And um, Grind Energy is an integrator technology. Um, you know, Melanie mentioned purpose and collaboration. And I think it's important to mention that it was really about a decade ago that our leadership really recognized the need for commercial operations to have an alternate solution for managing their food scraps. And Grind Energy was designed to bridge the gap between food service operations and um, anaerobic digesters. So during that, this time, we really collaborated with food service operations, including the Ohio State University, as well as with Quasar Energy Group to develop a solution that would improve back of house food service operation and food scrap collection and deliver a, a contaminant free energy feedstock to an anaerobic digester. So in addition to colleges and universities, we're working across the country with commercial businesses such as sports venues, corporate dining and grocers. And um, so with the DI hub, as Melanie mentioned, this was a new build. Um, uh, we initially met with Melanie and I think one of the food service managers to start the conversation about Grind to Energy. We subsequently met with the facilities management team and we also worked with the university architect. Um, it was really important to make sure that with this program, we found an appropriate system placement for um, the operation, but also to maintain the aesthetics and the integrity of the DI hub overall. So I wanted to share um, a picture. This is a top-down CAD drawing of the system placement. Um, the processing table is actually placed just um, off of the dish room um, and the holding tank um, is placed in their compactor room and it is an indoor uh, tank installation. So um, uh, I would like to share a video um, to give you an idea of the grinding process. Um, and then before we do, I just would like to mention these photographs here, um, just showcase the actual installation that's underway and um, the commissioning and training of the system. So as you can see here, um, Grind Energy uh, has the capacity to accept all types of um, food scraps. So this includes not only post-consumer, but also bones, raw meat, and kitchen fats, oils, and grease can also go through our grinding system. And so for a business that generates about three tons of food scraps a week, our system's running for just about one hour each day. And we have that information through our Internet of Things uh, dashboard. Um, our, we have full visibility into all of our systems across the country. 
and our customers have their own um, personalized dashboard. So they're able to uh, look at system usage, um, tonnage, uh, views, uh, training videos, and also print sustainability reports. So I wanted to share a sustainability report here that reflects um, the uh, renewable energy benefits from all of our college and university customers. So collectively, um, our um, university customers have diverted more than 2.8 million pounds of food scraps for renewable energy production. And this has gen generated enough electricity to power 287 homes for an entire month, removed um, the carbon emission equivalent of 2.4 million fewer car miles driven, and has also generated 81 tons of a nutrient rich fertilizer. Additionally, uh, we do have tank level sensors. So we are able to um, monitor our tanks. Um, for example, Kent State can log into their dashboard and um, view their tank levels. But we also have an algorithm built in to the system. So when um, our customers' tanks are about two days away from needing to get pumped out, um, they're going to be getting an email notification so they can schedule a pump out appropriately um, and maximize a full tank pump out. So before I turn things over to Mark, I have one more video that I'd like to share with you. And it shows the back of house um, installation where the uh, holding tank is at the DI hub. So we're um, at the DI hub here at Penn State. I'm gonna walk around the corner to one of their dock areas. And the granite energy tank is placed inside. Um, we're gonna start out at the end here. This is the discharge valve where the Quasar's truck comes to pump the material out, runs alongside the room. And then um, we've got a 5,000 gallon uh, holding tank here at Kent State. We do have the technology to heat any exterior cold climate tank. So this system does have reflective uh, covers on the inside to keep the slurry from freezing as well as heat tracing and insulation along any of the exposed piping. Thank you, Heather. Um, my name is Mark. I'm with Quasar. Uh, with an Ohio, we're an Ohio-based company that's built more than 25 facilities uh, since 2009. Uh, currently, Quasar has 10 uh, anaerobic digesters in, in the construction phase at, at Dairy and Hog. Uh, facilities and uh, all of these farms will feed biogas directly into uh, natural gas pipelines. Quasar owns and operates uh, on a network of facilities and provides feedstock sourcing services to underutilized digesters at publicly owned wastewater treatment plants. Um, I'm going to show you a couple videos. The first video you'll be seeing is from our Collinwood Bioenergy facility. It's also in Cleveland where the Kent State food waste comes. Uh, this facility handles more than 40,000 gallons a day of biosolids, food waste, fats, oils, and greases, and other industrial wastewaters. Uh, this facility has a one megawatt generator with an interconnection agreement uh, to Cleveland Public Power. This is Quasar's Collinwood facility. Um, this is the entrance, the, the road that the trucks take to get into the facility. There's a liquids receiving pit in the ground right here that holds 24,000 gallons of, of material. This is a solids receiving hopper where dump trailers of food waste, uh, bio solids from wastewater treatment plants, and uh, dissolved air flotation greases from larger food manufacturers will deliver to. Um, this tank is a 230,000 gallon biomass holding tank. We have one 750,000 gallon tank here and one behind it. Uh, this has a inflatable a dual membrane dome where gas is stored in that dome. Um, and then we have a CNG fueling station right over here, an emergency flare when the engine's not running. The engine, uh, that produces, right now it's producing 800 kW, 
of power uh, that goes to Cleveland Public Power is right back here. And then over here we have another 230,000 gallon storage tank and a centrifuge that's dewatering uh, the slurry that's in the digester. Um, that material, the liquids get sent to Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District and the solids are uh, class B biosolids that get spread on farm fields. So this is a picture of the truck that actually picks up the Kent State's uh, grind energy system. This truck runs on natural gas that is compressed at the Collinwood facility. Uh, these, these are the tanks for uh, the compressed natural gas tanks on the truck. Uh, we have a couple other videos that we're going to show. Um, there's a picture of the engine and the generator. Uh, that's basically in a containerized unit and it, uh, we're going to show you the container that houses that unit. And then the next two pictures will show the inside uh, of that container. It's, uh, this is a 16 cylinder uh, Caterpillar engine that runs at 1800 RPM. Um, the first video is a video of the, the inside of the building at Collinwood. The second video is uh, we'll give you insight into our SCADA system and describes how the facility operates on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, the third video is of the solids uh, receiving hopper that allows the dump trailers to deliver the dewatered sludges uh, to mix in with the biomass, uh, mix into the biomass tank. And then the last video, um, or the fourth video, excuse me, is a video that shows an overview of our property from the top of our digester tank. And um, it starts off by showing a building under construction. That's the future location of the Cleveland Food Bank Distribution Center, where they're gonna have a grinder installed there and take any of the perishable food um, that is unable to be served to the public right to our digester facility. In addition to that, we have a class A processing system where the material goes through a pasteurization process to further reduce pathogens to a non-detectable limit. The class A biosolids have a uh, more stringent requirements that will enable them to be applied not only on agricultural land but the public access areas such as private lawns and home gardens as well. The class B biosolids um, are almost exclusively applied to agricultural land and are prohibited from public access areas. This is the pump room where the pumps will empty out the liquids receiving pit and then also run it through the heat exchanger to bring it up to temperature. Mesophilic digesters run between 95 and 105 degrees Fahrenheit. And then these are the controls uh, for all the pumps, mixers, and blowers in the plant. This is the control area for the operators. Uh, it is uh, the brains of the operation. So we have each of the different tanks, uh, the temperatures of them, fill levels, uh, the amount of pressure in the digester tanks, uh, the dosing amount for each digester, right now we're feeding 40,000 gallons a day to this facility, and we're generating 760, 770 kW uh, through the CHP unit. Um, this shows our solid receiving hopper, the augers, the grinder, the open hopper pump that's processing the material uh, into the biomass receiving tank. Uh, this shows our heating and dosing. So our heat exchangers bring the material up to temperature. Right now we're at 103.8 and 105 degrees in the digester, so we're at perfect temperature. Um, from this to be built facility, and then coming right into our liquids receiving pit. Back behind here, these are our pasteurization tanks where we can make class A biosolids. And that's a storage tank of the class A biosolids. And then we have our dump trailers. The 
these next two uh, videos are showing uh, farm fields that have received the Class B biosolids. This is a video showing that this corn is about 43 to 46 inches tall. This is in the buffer zone. This is the corn that has been applied on. Right now I see 82 inches and that's not even the top of the stock. All of these corn stalks are at the same height over here in the non-buffer zone. So we had 42 inches in the other area and this is at least 82 inches through this area. So basically the buffer zone means an area that we are not allowed to apply on, which would be within a certain number of feet from houses or from property lines. And the uh, non-buffer zone is the area we've applied on. So you can see a, a significant increase in um, the yields from, from doing that. Um, and that was, that was uh, the buffer zone in that field had hog manure applied on it. So it had uh, fertilizer, um, through the, the hog manure, but the class B biosolids have uh, significantly uh, better nutrient value and organic content. And um, I'll just read an excerpt from a farmer that had received our material for more than three years. This is his quote. The Quasar product used on, used on my farm visually speaks for itself. Regular commercial man-made fertilizer was used around the outside of my fields. Where the man-made fertilizer was used, the crop was noticeably a much lighter color of green and 20 inches shorter. The corn and soybeans where the Quasar product was applied was much darker, green in color, and appeared healthier from emergence. A healthier plant equates to more bushels per acre. With farming costs as they are, this product could be a game changer on the overall bottom line. Our farm being the oldest longest contiguous, continuous farm in Wayne County will prosper for years to come by use of this product. So we've, we've consistently over the past 10 years seen easily 30% increases in corn, soybeans, wheat, and hay. And many of the farmers that we work with uh, belong to co-ops that also provide feed to the many food manufacturers throughout the state. So with that said, I'd like to bring it back full circle here and I'll turn it over to uh, to Melanie. Thanks, Mark. So <clears throat> I just wanted to take a moment to share our sustainability report. Heather showed you one earlier. Um, this is just from the first eight months of um, operations of the Grind to Energy System at the DI Hub. Um, it launched in September of 2020, so this goes through July 2021. We had 25.3 tons of food waste. Um, and, you know, I mentioned earlier about us trying to get data on our waste streams. We didn't have good data about exactly how much food waste we were producing, but now we have really great data on how much food waste um, we're producing and capturing here. And so that 25.3 tons of food waste um, produced enough energy to power uh, five homes for a month. Um, it was the equivalent of uh, 41,979 fewer miles driven and um, 1.4 tons of biosolids actually return nutrients to Ohio farm fields where a lot of our, our food is grown on campus. And then the last slide I wanna share with you is just a little bit about what is next for Kent State University. Um, one is that we've been so happy with the grind energy system um, at the DI hub that we are adding a second grind energy system on our campus at our Eastway dining facility, which is actually our largest dining facility on campus. Um, I mentioned our solar um, arrays before. We are also going to be adding six megawatts of ground-mounted solar at the Kent campus with battery storage. And uh, we're, we're working on expanding our EV charging as well um, as we support alternative forms of transportation. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Heather. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, thank you both so much, um, Melanie and Mark. I really enjoyed putting this 
um, presentation together with you, um, this virtual tour. Um, uh, you're, you're great partners and we appreciate everyone's time to join us uh, today um, and hear a little bit about our circular food economy here in Northeast Ohio. Please reach out to any of us. Our contact information is listed here. Um, and please, of course, let's keep this converse or create a conversation if we can. And please utilize the chat feature um, during the conference. We will be monitoring that and certainly happy to answer any questions and welcome hearing your feedback. So uh, have a wonderful conference and thank you again. Okay, great. Um, uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, uh, really appreciate, again, uh, you joining us. It looks like there were some um, questions that came through in the chat, and Melanie and Mark, thank you um, for answering those. Maybe we can begin um, and just talk through some of those with the group, and then, of course, everyone else, please, um, please type in any questions that you do have into the chat, and we'll um, will answer your questions, but maybe we could begin, Mark, um, you were just answering a question about um, really the different the difference, difference between the EPA class A and class B um, classifications. Yeah, so um, yeah, uh, Deborah's question of, you know, is it not safe for public areas? So um, in this, case safety is defined by fecal coliform and uh, heavy metals for any materials in the digesters. Uh, over the past 30 years, we've done a, a really terrific job of reducing heavy metals in all waste streams kind of coming into wastewater treatment plants and um, pretreatment programs that are used by publicly owned wastewater treatment plants. So we've, we've never really seen any problems uh, from a heavy metal standpoint on any of our sludges. The fecals are, are basically in the anaerobic digestion process. Those are reduced uh, by 90 some percent um, because of the heat and the time in the digester that it goes through. There's typically further processing that needs to be done to achieve class A after an anaerobic digestion. And that could be pasteurization or it could be a, a heat, heat process uh, in some form. And that just uh, further reduces the fecal to basically an undetectable level. Um, during application, um, when class B biosolids are applied on a field, uh, there can be no access to those fields for at least 30 days after the application takes place. So animals are, are not allowed on those fields. Um, you know, none of the fields that we apply on with class B are for human consumption. It's all for uh, grazing uh, land or wheat for, uh, that goes into the food production for animals uh, to consume. Um, so I think I think that answers that question. Um, Heather, is that? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, and uh, you know, as I understand it, you know, we've talked about this over the years um, with the land application um, that quasar exceeds the um, criteria required for that land application as well. So um, I think that's important to mention. Um, and um, there were a couple operational questions, Melanie, maybe you could um, speak to that. I know um, Doreen had a question just about the, um, uh, the dumpster sensors that you had mentioned that the university used. Would you um, mind please just sharing a little bit about um, the type of visibility and how that's measured um, and how that works for the university? Sure, the, the sensors that we had previously and the ones that we're piloting now, um, they're volume sensors. So um, it's basically uh, taking a picture or sending out a signal um, to measure how full the, the container is. And when you install it, you have to have precise measurements of how big the container is and how high the sensor is mounted and all of that. Um, and they provide tremendous data for us that we've really been able to use to modify our pickup schedules um, to make sure that, you know, we're not sending more trucks uh, running around than we need to. Um, um, the company we were using previously is no longer in business, and that's why we are currently doing 
the pilot with NordSense um, and uh, very similar technology. They are actually getting a new sensor, so we're going to shortly be piloting their old sensor and the new sensor to, to see if they have um, uh, refined the, the way that they produce the data for us. It's really interesting, actually, <laughs> the way that that process goes forward, but um, it's really convenient to have the data on all the containers. Okay, great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you can't manage what you can't see, right? <laughs> So it's good to have that visibility. Um, Mary Beth had a question, and um, uh, what are some of the challenges uh, you see with the inputs or maintenance of the systems throughout the process? Um, specifically, are there odors or other hazards that need to be mitigated? And I'm not sure if that was on the campus side with the Grind Energy System or um, with Quasar, but I think that we could probably um, answer that um, for both um, both of the applications. So, Mark, maybe you could begin with that um, at, on, uh, at Collinwood? Sure. So, there's, um, as materials come into the plant, we have a number of um, mitigation, odor mitigation um, designs and, and technologies in place to be able to help with that. Obviously, you know, as food waste breaks down or as, as any materials break down, there's odor associated with that. So, we have to do our best to to constantly monitor that. We use biofilters, we use um, a uh, odor neutralizing uh, spray in the receiving area, which is typically the most uh, od odiferous uh, part of the plant. Um, the gas does not get released because we want to capture that gas for um, energy, the, the methane that's generated from the digester for uh, electricity generation and natural gas production. So, you know, there's from the digester tanks themselves, there's there's no gas that comes out of um, out of there. It's really just the the processing uh, standpoint. And um, in the case of the Collinwood facility, we also have a dewatering a centrifuge that dewaters the sludge uh, prior to going to land application. So um, that's another area that you would have uh, potentially materials exposed to the atmosphere and all of that air uh, from that treatment process is captured and run through the biofilter. So um, I think over the past five to 10 years, we've really put a big focus on on trying to uh, mitigate odors as much as possible and design facilities that can be placed in, in locations that um, are more um, uh, around people. Um, and I think one of the questions that, you know, was, was that Deborah also asked was, how can this be scaled for more local use? And that's a big part of it is, is knowing where the end product is going and that we can control odors. You know, supply is, is a big part of that, but then also the, the treatment technology is, is continuing to evolve as well. Yeah, great. Thank you, Mark. And, you know, and I'll step in um, to just to answer a little bit about the grind energy system itself. Um, Mary Beth, the, um, so the, the grind energy holding tank is a sealed tank. The, the whole system is a closed system, so it's non-sewer based. And um, we do have uh, carbon filters on the tank um, to mitigate any odors, um, you know, with that process. And I also think it's important to mention that it really is a holding tank. So there's a little bit of um, fermentation that might begin or hydrolysis um, while the material's in the tank. Um, but, uh, you know, all of the, um, the anaerobic digestion takes place at, at the digester. Um, it really is just a holding tank. And Melanie, I don't know if you have any um, just insight um, with the system on campus that you could share? Sure. I mean, we have not had any problems with odors from the grind to energy system, but when it was first installed or when there are people who are new to the system, uh, they're often skeptical that that can be the case. And a couple times we did have complaints of odors from um, sort of the, the back dock of that dining facility. And so we went and explored it, but in both cases, it was not the grind wow. energy system that was causing odors. And actually in the second case, it was some new staff who were not uh, fully using the system and put food waste into the dumpster. And then that was what was causing the odors, uh, not having it diverted directly into grind energy. So I, I have nothing but positive feedback on that score. 
Yeah, I, Heather, you may be able to speak to this more, but you know, in any back of the house or or any restaurant or uh, event center or anything like that that's using a, a compactor or a dumpster to manage food waste, it's the difference between the two systems are are incredibly uh, they're so they're so con contrasting of of each other because uh, there's no uh, raccoons can't get into it, other animals can't get into it. Um, they're not dragging things out of the dumpster. Uh, it's not related to a, a, a new employee dumping something as they as they try to get off the dock. So I think you know the cleanliness and the odor at the at the um, restaurant or event center um, or cafeteria is much improved. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you both for sharing that. Um, uh, to share a little bit more insight, my background is actually food service um, and hospitality here in Cleveland. So um, many years ago, I worked with the Cleveland Indians and Cavaliers um, and also worked with, in healthcare at university hospitals, all in food service capacity. Um, so I really do have that firsthand experience for, um, you know, managing large volumes of inedible food scraps. Um, and to Mark's point, with the with this program, it streamlines multiple programs into one. It's a sealed holding tank. You process the food and you walk away. And it really does improve that back of house um, cleanliness um, and hygiene. So uh, absolutely. Um, thank you both. There's um, a few more questions. Um, Beth had asked, um, how does the process relate? I think um, we're talking about the digester, Mark. Um, how does the process relate to the um, living machine um, at AJLC, Environmental Studies Center at Oberlin College? Do you have some participation with that? Or um, Beth, maybe you could give us a little. Um, no, I'm not aware of that. A little more um, insight into um, your question so we can make sure that we answer it. Um, and then Deborah also had asked about, uh, Mark, any concerns um, that um, the anaerobes could somehow cause health problems if they escape um, from the facility, any type of leakage concerns? Yeah, I mean, the, the only way that you could have something escape is if a pipe would break or some, some type of uh, non-standard uh, event where the containment, you know, there's a containment area around the digester. Um, I think I've, I've seen one or two um, leaks or, you know, uh, equipment malfunctions um, in the past five years for, for our facilities. So it's a, a very rare occurrence. Um, and that kind of ties into Tammy asked the question of, you know, is there any possibility of, of biocells uh, getting into water sources? So um, applications in farm fields are done. Uh, Ohio EPA uh, strictly manages and has rules and regulations around applications. So if there's rain in the forecast, um, if fields have tile uh, are tiled, so you have to plug the tile so that it doesn't get into the waterway. You have certain application rates depending on um, what they're growing, what the soil conditions are, uh, slopes in the farm fields you have to pay attention to, and all of that affects the the uh, application rate of of how much biosolids are applied on those fields. So, very um, very safe process, very limited problems that that happen uh, once the material leaves the plants. Um, so, you know, the, the, uh, the risk factor is, is very, very low, uh, for, for something causing a problem, uh, in the, in the public realm. Thanks, Mark. Um, another question just about the feedstocks, um, that Quasar takes in, um, Aaron asked if, uh, Cleveland water and or sewer systems send their biosolids your way. Yeah, so uh, Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District has a um, incinerator uh, um, uh, at the Sully, Sully facility off of 77 that takes uh, all of Easterly's and Southerly's biosolids. Uh, Westerly had an incinerator that that um, that needed too much maintenance, um, and so that was bid out for public bid last year. Uh, we we did win that that bid. So we take Westerly's biosolids 
uh, to our facility. It previously was going to the landfill, so it's a uh, being handled in a much more sustainable uh, process. So, uh, you know, there's there's some long term conversations being had about how best to manage those biosolids. Um, if it would be to you know to handle them with with an outside contractor or to to bring that to the Southerly facility as well. So uh, over the next couple of years, that'll get that'll get figured out. Great, thanks, Mark. Um, and Colleen is asking um, if we've partnered with any K twelve schools, um, which is a great question. And um, actually, uh, next week we are installing with our first uh, public. Um, high school. Um, it's uh, here in Ohio. So again, keeping Ohio on the map of sustainability, we're very excited about that. Um, I think that we'll, you'll probably be seeing some PR around that. Um, we're excited to get that going. And then we do also work with a, um, a private boarding school um, out east as well. So I'm happy to talk with anybody on this call. Colleen, certainly happy to have a conversation to hear about um, your schools, what you're doing now, and, and talk a little bit more about um, the opportunity. So thank you. And um, Raina, we have another question. Um, how does AD uh, anaerobic system, how does the system compare cost-wise in terms of emission reductions to a composting system um, for schools or restaurants? And uh, what is the likelihood of rolling out a technology like this large scale across the city? Um, I'm going to answer your second question first, and Mark, you might, uh, or Melanie, please let me know if you have any other insight. Um, I think what's interesting about anaerobic digestion is oftentimes, and Quasar is also working um, with some public-private partnerships um, for Worc at Worcester, for example, wastewater treatment facility. So, um, if you know. There are many wastewater treatment plants across the country are using anaerobic digestion to manage the sewerage that's coming in. Um, so many of them, and this is um, emerging really, um, uh, it's an exciting time because they're upgrading their technologies to accept this outside food slurry that has a really high energy value. Um, so as, you know, as far as this particular program, program that we have in place, it's geared towards commercial businesses. But on a residential level, you know, there really is an opportunity for, um, you know, either a residential collection program or, of course, I need to mention as an incinerator representative that if you have a food disposer in your home and your wastewater treatment plant has a digester, you're already participating in this um, process to create renewable energy. So it really is an exciting time. And as far as um, emissions reduction, um, as compared to a compost system. Mark, do you, can you answer or talk to that a little bit? I, I don't have a, I don't have a number in mind of, you know, reduction from a, from a composting system. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, again, we came from um, business, you know, composting is kind of early generation and aerobic digestion kind of takes composting farther and allows more um, you have the same benefits of composting with nutrients, um, but mm -hmm. you also get the energy capture out of it. So I would say that anaerobic digestion is a, is an upgraded composting, uh, process. Um, mm -hmm. and I would say to add to what Heather said about, um, kind of how to roll this out on a residential, uh, setup. So, uh, Canada has been I would say much more um, uh, for, with a lot more foresight with with uh, green bin programs on uh, um, collection um, setups. And in order to take on something like that, um, they installed like a twenty million dollar uh, facility to to pre-process um, the material because there was like a 25 or 50 percent I, I don't remember the exact number but it was above 25 percent contamination from these curbside um pickups and it'll take significant dollars to be able to process that in a way that doesn't damage pumps and um the the, the di digester plants so um you know that would be something that would be required 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Mark. And and two, back, you know, during the presentation, Melanie talked about the EPA food recovery hierarchy. And, you know, I think that, you know, when I was in food service, I, you know, I, I still go to that. I, you know, the EPA has got such great resources, um, but they really do, um, the EPA does a really great job in that hierarchy. And, you know, you can, if, if you, if you go to their website, they're going to talk in much more detail about um, each um, of the processes that they recommend um, you take for managing um, surplus food and, of course, inedible scraps. And, um, you know, the recommendation for processing food with industrial uses, which includes anaerobic digestion, um, you know, again, to Mark's point, it's creating a fertilizer and additionally, it's creating renewable energy. So um, we do have just a few more minutes. Um, and um, so, uh, Deborah, thanks for your question um, about the kitchen um, food disposers. And uh, yes, yeah, so to clarify or you know, talk a little bit more about that, if you um, if there if the wastewater treatment plant um, in your community is using anaerobic digestion technology to manage the sewerage that's coming in through the sewer system, um, the food material from your food disposer. Um, is indeed being processed through that anaerobic digestion process. So some of those wastewater treatment plants have the capability to accept the outside food slurry, um, and some are genuinely just designed to manage the scraps that are coming through their sewerage system, which still holds an energy value. Um, but if you just think about the outside food scraps, for example, that Kent State is sending to Quasar, that's inedible food production scraps that hold their, um, still hold their highest energy value. So um, are there any other questions? We have just a couple more minutes. I think- I'd um, like to just step in and thank everyone for joining the Circular Economy and Food Waste Breakout Session. And thank you so much to Heather, Mark, and Melanie. Um, if you are interested in learning more about the circular economy, we encourage you to check out tomorrow afternoon's sessions on Circular Cleveland in our neighborhoods and Circular Economy in Industry. Thanks, everybody. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Kathy, Melanie, and Mark.